Joining me today over coffee at the Office Cafe in Brussels, I talk to Arnie Lees, Social Democrat MEP from Germany. We talk about the rule of law in Poland, climate diplomacy and the Munich Security Conference. You're from East Germany. Right. Your father was, is a pastor. How does that dynamic lead you into politics? Well, I had a very interesting background. My parents were fighting for democracy, human rights, free media, free education. So they were in the opposition movement. Uh, we were on the full fledge of Stasi. We were the first one reading the Stasi record. My parents, particularly my father, was involved in the first interims parliament. So I, I learned how to stand against the whole political system, what democracy is all about. Uh, is uh, fighting now for your rights. And so when you're I, I in interacted. school, you learn something else. What did they teach you in school? Well, in school, actually. Wasn't fighting against rights. Right. right. I mean, in school, growing up in East Germany, I learned how to throw hand grenades. Uh, if you look back, how important peace is, how important it is to have a European Union. So, hand grenades, because the West Germans might come, the British might come, the Americans might come to, uh, to destroy our cities. So, I'm so happy that the young Germans don't even have to join the army anymore. It's now uh, your own decision. And that's why I joined politics. You know, peace means something to me. Democracy means something to me. Coming from... Uh, uh, Are you concerned by Poland and the... the I'm retros- deeply concerned. I'm calling myself a Visegrad German, understanding the complexity and the difficulties. Also the migration issue, but uh, the rule of law should never be destroyed. It's a, it's a backbone of our democracy. It's backbone for business. It's backbone for our institutions. But the Polish government said they're strengthening the rule of law. They're not undermining it. Well, they're lying. And uh, so I'm called even a year ago already on Article 7 to be straightforward on the Polish government. Uh, we have the best business relationship between Poland and Germany, for example. It's running very smoothly. So we are, and have to be, so thankful to the Polish people, in particular East Germany, bringing and having democracy. But now let's fight and work on this together. Glasnost and Perestroika was given to us also by Gorbachev. So let's not give it up to authoritarian regimes, to nationalism. Does it surprise you that the Polish president is now more popular after the the passing of a law which bans the speaking about Polish collaboration and uh, and the persecution of the Jews during the Second World War? I'm an historian, I'm very nervous on that. I had a great speaker in the Munich Security Conference, a journalist from the New York Times, and he said that uh, his family comes from Poland and they were, were Polish neighbors, giving their names to the Nazis. Many of the people of the family died in the Holocaust. And he asked the Prime Minister of Poland, so how is it for him if he goes and says that in Poland, uh, then he would be in jail? And the Prime Minister said, no, that's not the case. But actually the law showcases that. And so Polish went a step too far. And as an historian, I'm calling on the Polish government to withdraw that situation, calling and saying that the camps uh, of the Nazis were German camps, not Polish camps, is, of course, clear and straight and needs to be addressed and needs to be counter addressed. But uh, collaboration happened, unfortunately, across Europe with the Nazis. And so that needs to be said. Because What's behind this? Is this? Because are there, it's, it's, this is a very national, weak psychological state where right. people are not able to recognize what happened and just deal with it. But they have to hide it or push it away. and and criticize those who would criticize them. What's, this, what's the mentality behind the Polish government? Is, is this just an excuse for something else? I mean, it, the answer lays in your question. It's nationalism. And it's a new rise of nationalism we face in many countries. The Nazis of Germany, the AFD, are also saying, let's get rid of looking at the Nazi history. Let's uh, not talk about the Holocaust anymore. Is this consistent with European democracy? That is very dangerous for European democracy. Uh, denying history, denying historic facts, uh, is also breaking your uh, identity, breaking reality, and actually facing that why our institutions are built the way they are to be independent, to have the independence of law, to have free media, to have free cultural institutions, to have free universities. So we have to be clear on that to all nations, in Poland, in Hungary, in Germany, um, in the United States, you know, you know, changing historical facts and trying to align them into a national picture. What the Polish government does a lot, also in the curriculum changes in the Polish schools. So that is nervously, uh, and that needs to be approached full fledged and very direct. 
as we still are. I mean, they agreed to join the European Union on the values and changing history by the textbooks uh, and trying to deny history is breaking uh, uh, the European identity. You just back from Munich. What was the story there? It was snowy, but we had hot debates. <laughs> there were many stories on the table. Uh, the major story was what is in the Middle East. Uh, Syria was on a full fledged. Um, we have to do more, and uh, John Kerry made it very clear, we have to do more diplomatic capacity into the region. Uh, because John Kerry always says that and nothing changes. So what's new out of Munich this time? Well, new was that uh, Netanyahu came with a piece of a drone. Uh, so we had the direct engagements between Iran and Israel, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Europe has to play a state. Uh, we do. We are in the whole region. We are the most important business partner to all of the countries. And so we can approach them on a different style. But does Israel trust Europe as an honest broker in this? Well, the question is who you consider being Israel. You know, if you talk on uh, Netanyahu, who has a very difficult situation, as there are many stories about his uh, legacy on corruption, so we have to look into that. Or we have to wait if anything changes. Netanyahu plays more with the White House than with the European foreign politics. For example, the Iran deal, he was also addressing it. Uh, we are in favor to keep the Iran deal. Uh, Netanyahu doesn't want that. So do you think that gives an opportunity for Europe to reorganize its policy towards Israel and, uh, and Palestine? Is, is, and did you, did you get any sense of this in Munich as well, that there was an opportunity? Yes, Trump did something which most people say is a miscalculation, will lead to turbulence. But does Europe see an opportunity for something new because of this? Well, it's interesting. Uh, I've met the head of UNRWA at the Munich Security Conference, and he uh, was uh, thanking the European Parliament that we came to a conclusion um, that we have a broad coalition across the party line uh, that UNRWA needs to be supported. Also, you dealt with arms exports at, at Munich. What's the framework for the next step of arms control? Well, this is actually a field I feel very strong about. It's too little impact, too little change. Uh, the Commission asks us now, we're actually in the middle of discussions and votes in the European Parliament, in the middle of a process, that the European Commission with the member states Take, us mon take money from the European budget in order to have uh, arms uh, development and equipment being built up. So the whole uh, um, a fund is now brought up by the Commission and I'm questioning that because parliamentarians don't have a say on that. It's just for the European defense business supporting them, but we are very inefficient. Millions of uh, euros are going to be thrown away by allowing ourselves to have uh, capacity in every country we have 15 tanks, we need two. So we have to actually be more efficient. That is an important step we have to do. We have to do conversion, we have to support this The European Defense Agency is working towards that, the harmonization and standardization. But this is going to be too slow. And now they take European money, and that's where I'm questioning that. In Washington, I'm sure you spoke about climate diplomacy as well. What does climate diplomacy actually mean? That is a new field I'm bringing into the European Parliament. You're a rapporteur on the AFED committee for this. Right. I do not only security and uh, development, I also do foreign politics. And uh, Steinmeier, our foreign minister at that time, brought this to Munich Security Conference that climate is a question of security as well, uh, for failing states, for differences, for migration, for military. So climate diplomacy, we're trying to bring into the foreign policy arena in the European Parliament. That means we should have annual reports. We should us and our all delegations we do, delegations around the world, of how the countries are working on their strategic plan to fulfill Paris. Um, what are the but NDCs, you, but also, but last point on that, uh, how is the European Foreign Service being built up? Do we have enough diplomatic people who work in the area of climate, of the complexity of climate finance, climate instruments, approaching mayors, approaching governors. So the arena change, the SDG sustainable development goals are a good toolbox for that as well. And that needs to be full-fledged uh, knowledgeable also by diplomats in the foreign service. We have only a handful of people, so we have to invest in that. It seems there's also a power shortage in Germany in the, the Socialist Party as well. What happened with Martin Schulz? His star was ascending and he ends up with no job at the end of it. How did it come to that? Well, it's a stretching uh, points which were lining up uh, in, in his situation. I mean, if you look at last year, actually to this time, we were high up in the pools. You're we thinking having him as a chancellor. 
and then many things uh, came in between uh, in a hurry situation. in a very much hurry but you know, this is how politics can play out. I had lunch with somebody yesterday here in Brussels and neither of us could really understand how Schulz walks away with nothing at the end of this. What was the dynamic that led to him not even getting the foreign ministry at the end? Well, I think the dynamics in particular on the foreign ministry was uh, on, be on behalf of his own saying that he would never work uh, under Merkel but this uh, is politics. Government. Surely he'd no, exactly. be forgiven that. No, but no, the, he was not because uh, there was because the main criticism came also from inside the party, but also from the public perception. You know, he he, he pronounced and he, he advocated himself with the backup of the party leadership that he would like to be the foreign minister. Also, we had an interaction between Gabriel and Martin Schulz. So uh, that also played into the situation. Is he being blamed for all of the woes of the Socialist Party in no, Germany at the moment? It he's looks not. like it. No, he's, you know, as you said, uh, now leaving the situation with, you know, any influence or not being the a party leader. You know, I was uh, supporting him. Yes, but a big selling point for Martin Schulz was his, his experience as the president of the European right. Parliament, right. which was underplayed in the, right. the, the election to some extent and his pro-European credentials, nothing cut through. Why was that? A question we ask ourselves. I mean, you mentioned yourself that we should have you brought more into the election campaign. Um, he, he, you know, his approach then was, uh, first of all, not interacting with uh, uh, elections in Northern West failure, which for his side was also a mistake. To, you know, he had a very much approach in the German public. He was seen and uh, uh, he, he stepped back not to interfere with the uh, elections in the biggest federal state of Germany and then he was not foreseen him so media stepped back as well and asked for various money shows. So there were many decisions. The miscalculation. Right. Miscalculations on how you drive an issue. Um, also when Macron made it, the European fear that European um, is under threat kind of disappeared a bit. We had this great, and I actually supported. So it. Macron took the energy out of Schulz's campaign. I don't know, to some but we had, for example, parts of Europe. You know, full Germany was every Sunday on the streets in the bigger cities. Yeah, you've been to Turkey recently as well. How did you find the country? Is there some stabilization, or do you think uh, President Erdogan has moved further towards an autocratic state? I think he's, he's uh, trying his best to, to stay in power and to actually put his country further in the direction we have seen. I went to Turkey because of the um, uh, processes. We had a, um, courts, uh, hearings uh, at that time for the media. Um, I supported Cumhuriyet and I called for the release of the uh, journalists from Europe and inside Turkey. And we just had a great breakthrough. Uh, Dennis Yücel finally has After been, a year he was in prison. Right. So that is a big success uh, of many people, but also of the European Parliament. And we still call for relief all the journalists. So we are strong on that and keep being strong on that. Not only the Europeans, but the Turkey as well. If Turkey would like to develop towards a democracy, uh, a cornerstone is free media, is independent courts. We don't have that. The, the, the language everyone understands is business. And uh, so our biggest tool is trade. Our biggest tool is uh, how we interact uh, with Turkey on this issue. So th that is the hard power, so to say. Uh, it's not a question of military. It's a question of trade. And uh, the business has a difficult situation in Turkey. Should you incentivize or with something positive? Or should you hurt him with something negative? Well, you can come up with positive steps if he's moving towards a democracy and, and, and relieving uh, the situation. Uh, until he is doing that, I think we have to be as straightforward and as tough as possible. All right, thank you. Thank you as well.